Hey guys, thanks for joining me for another episode of Learn to Play Games. My name is Lance, and today we're going to take a look at The Walking Dead All Out War. This is Mantic's newest game, and it is a scrimmage game, so you're going to be playing with one to two players. You could stretch it to team games where you have two versus two for a two to four player game. It takes roughly an hour to two hours to play, depending upon the size of the group that you play, which you'll decide that at the beginning of the game. Before the game starts, you guys will create your own groups to uh, take on each other. It is a competitive game, so each player is going to be playing against the other player to be the overall winner by uh, achieving the objectives first or whatever the scenario is that you guys are playing. So the backstory to this is that you're playing in the Walking Dead universe. Now this one takes place in the comics, so you might see some different characters than you do in the TV show, and of course the characters are going to look more like the comics and you won't notice the, uh, the ones in the show coming up. So other than that, each player will uh, put together a group of survivors, and there is certain guidelines that you'll follow to do this, and there will be a point limit, so you can play with a 150 point game, or a 100 point game, or 50 points, or whatever you guys choose to play as, and then you'll construct your survivor groups based on that. Now on top of that, of course, as it being The Walking Dead, you will have the, uh, the walkers in it, and they are going to be playing as the third party that will be, uh, they won't have their own turn, but they're going to interact based on what both players do as you move around the board and make noise or mayhem by firing different weapons or doing different things. You will be pulling the, the Walking Dead towards your direction, or if you, uh, part of the strategy of it is working so that you can pull the Walking Dead, but towards your enemy. And that will follow suit with the other player based on what they do. So the dead will have a third part in this, but uh, have a, an ability to really mess with both players depending upon how the players play. And that's part of the strategy of figuring out how to use them as a tool to help you defeat your opponent. So my impressions of the game so far is it's a, it's a uh, scrimmage game. So just like a lot of the other ones that Mantic puts out. Um, the rules are well done, but they are very heavy. This is not a light game. This isn't an easy pickup game. Um, it does have a lot of intensive rules, as you will see in this uh, teaching video. Um, it's going to be a long video. Unfortunately, there's nothing I can do about it as far as the length. I will try to keep it as minimal as possible, but there are a lot of rules to cover. So uh, keep that in mind as you watch this. Uh, it is going to take a little bit more for me to get through it. Um, on top of that... Um, I think I really do like that they uh, the way that they worked the the walkers in this as them being not having their own turn, uh, just basically interacting and working with the other players as they do things. So you really have to learn how to use the Walking Dead in a way that is beneficial to you. Um, on top of the fact that you're trying to counter your opponent. So it's a whole different way of thinking as opposed to your normal scrimmage games where it's just you versus your opponent and you're trying to either kill each other or do different objectives. This is a totally different entity that's brought into here to really mess with your head and add a whole nother level of strategy, which I, I find is really interesting and intriguing. As far as the game itself, uh, the miniatures are, are pretty good looking. Uh, the rules seem to be, be pretty fleshed out. Uh, like I said, the only downside is, is that there are a lot of them. You will probably be referencing the rule book from time to time, and it, your first couple games are going to go slower because of that learning curve. So that's the only downside to it that I see right now is that they, it is kind of rules intensive. Now they do provide some guides and things to help you along and some quick references, which are really nice. And they try to streamline as much as possible, like the, the ruler that they give you will list not only your, um, your basic movement, but your running movements, the walkers uh, shamble, uh, mayhem movements, and all those type of things. So instead of having to always measure things out uh, each time, you, you have that little ruler that you can use, and based on the side, uh, will give you all that information right there, which is pretty cool. So... Other than that, like I said, it's a scrimmage game. If that's your thing, then this is definitely going to appeal to you, and I definitely would recommend checking it out. If you're looking for a board game uh, that's based on The Walking Dead, then this may not be the one for you, as it is straight up a scrim scrimmage game. There aren't a lot of scenarios yet, but they have a ton of expansions coming out that are going to add new content and new survivors, as well as survivor packs or walker packs that will let you change your game in different ways and expand the group of, of survivors that you have to choose from, which is pretty neat. Um, 
other than that, uh, like I said, it's it is a solid game, and I I definitely see them going far with this. But if you're looking for a more traditional Walking Dead uh, board game or a, a cooperative game, this is not going to meet those needs for you. So without further ado, let's go ahead and head to the table, and I'll teach you guys how to play. Dice play an important role in Walking Dead. So there are three different sets of dice. We have our combat and defensive dice, and there are three strengths. There are the weakest, which are the red dice, your mid-range, which are your white dice, and the strongest dice, which are the blue dice. And as you can see on the red dice, there's their symbols, and the white and blue get stronger from there. Now, there's also a panic dice, which we're going to go over the different symbols that are on the panic dice later on during that section. And then finally, we have the 50-50 chance dice, or the black action dice, which will have three faces with the shield on it and three sides with the blank on it. And you will use this during a number of different sections, which we're going to take a look at. Let's take a closer look at some of the survivor cards now. So at the top of each survivor's card will be the survivor's name, and some of them will also have a subtitle which will list what part of the story they're from. As with Rick, there are going to be multiple versions of him as you progress in the Walking Dead series. So next to the name will be an icon that some of the survivors will have, which will associate them with a particular type of group, which will be important when you build your group. Underneath that is the specialty of that character, and there are five different specialties. You have bruisers, tacticians, marksmen, support, and runners. Underneath that is the melee, shot, and defense dice that that character will roll when they need to, and their nerve rating, which will come into play later, which I'll show you on the threat track. Underneath that will be the health that that player has or character. At the top corner is the cost of that character when you're building your group, and then any special rules that that character has. And then going around the outside of the character's card will be a number of slots that you can equip equipment with or items. So in the top corner and of both sides, you have the headgear that you can equip and any body armor that you might be able to have. After that, then you have the right and left side items for their different hands. And then underneath you have the backpack, which will list a number of slots, as you can see, like Rick can hold three different items, where Carl can only hold one, as there's only a picture of one outline there. Here we have two different decks in the game. So the first one we're going to take a look at is the supply deck. At the beginning of the game, this is the deck that will be shuffled up, and whenever a survivor searches a supply counter, they're going to go ahead and draw one of these cards from the supply deck. And as you can see, there is a number of different options that are different items that can come up. We have ammo reloads, metal pipes, and sometimes even zombies that will come up in that. Now the other deck we're going to look at is the equipment deck. This is the, the deck that players are going to look at before the game when they're building their, their group. And these items will all have point values so that you can equip those and add the points to that survivor. And so as you can see here, we have a melee weapon, the hatchet, it has a specific extra special ability, and then we have the pistol as well, which will list the range that the weapon has. Again, its cost, and then any special things that it has. On top of with the pistol, it does cause mayhem when you use it, which we're going to cover a little bit more later. Here we have some of the cards from the event deck. So during the event phase, you're going to go ahead and draw one of these cards. If it lists that it has a plus to the threat, then you're going to increase the threat on your threat gauge. So for example, if we drew one of those cards, you would increase the threat. And then from there, you would check where your threat level is and read that section if it has it on the card. If it does, then you would go ahead and follow that section's guidelines and resolve the effects of that section. Here we have the threat track, which is broken down into four different sections. We have the all quiet, low threat, medium threat, and high threat. And if the gauge ever reaches 18, then the game is immediately over and the survivors have lost. Other than that, the threat gauge will be adjusted each time survivors perform mayhem, or during certain event cards that are resolved, it will increase. And there are a couple other things that will cause it to increase as well. On top of that, when survivors activate, 
each survivor that activates will check the gauge and compare it to their nerve rating. If the gauge is higher than their nerve rating, then they are panicking and must roll the panic dice. Now there are a couple ways to reduce the threat level that survivors can perform, which we'll cover during the survivor's turn. With noise and run, they are two main concepts I'd like to cover. So before I get into that, the first thing I want to note is that I've marked my survivor with a token. Normally you would not do this, but since none of my models are painted, it's easy to identify which ones are the survivors then. And I'll do this throughout the rest of the video as well. From here, the definition of noise is when noise is caused the closest eligible walker at least partially within 10 inches of the source of the noise immediately moves in a straight line directly towards it. If this move brings them into base contact with a survivor, then they are engaged in melee. So there's a number of different ways that survivors can cause noise. The first one of which is to perform a run action, which is an eight inch move. So let's go ahead and take a look at what this does. So Rick is gonna go ahead and move his eight inches and then he's going to immediately, after he performs his action, resolve noise. So the walker that is closest to him, within 10 inches, so right now we have all three walkers, but this one is the closest, so it's going to move directly towards that source of noise by a shamble, which is a six inch move. And so it does come into contact with Rick, so now they would be engaged in melee combat. With Mayhem, it's an even worse version of noise. So let's go ahead and say, for example, Rick went ahead and shot at this zombie here and did enough damage to kill it and remove it. Once this shot is resolved, then we would trigger a Mayhem, which is that the threat gauge will move up one point, and then all zombies within 10 inches will perform a shamble towards the, the source of the noise, or the Mayhem. So we have a zombie here that is within... 10 so he'll move towards Rick and this zombie over here will do the same thing which will bring him into contact with Rick. So in this video I'm not going to go over the board setup as there's only one core scenario in the box and as the other expansions come out there'll be additional scenarios that will outline the different ways of setting up on top of that, you can also just set up a board any way you want to. So there's a lot of different variables with it. So I will cover a couple of the highlights of it though. Uh, first, obviously you would choose the scenario that you wish to play, and then you would build a group by agreeing on the points limits with your opponent. So whatever you and your opponent talk about, you can set it at 100 or 200 points, and then you would build your group based on that. Next, you would establish the playing area by laying out any tokens or tiles that you need. Then you would set the scene by reading out the scenario that is in the book or um, one of the other expansions. And then you would set up your forces and deploy. The Walking Dead game is played over a variable number of turns, which each turn consisting of four different phases in order, which are the action phase, the event phase, the melee phase, and the end phase. And we're gonna go ahead and take a look at each one of these phases in closer detail. Before we get into the first phase, the last thing we need to do is talk about initiative, which if you're playing a scenario, most of the time the scenario will tell you who gets the initiative, and other times it's going to have you roll, the, one of the players roll a dice, and if they roll the shield, then they receive initiative. If they roll the blank, then the opponent receives it. Otherwise, whoever has the initiative will get the Sheriff's Badge. So we're going to go ahead and give it to Rick and uh, Carl for this one. The first phase in each round is the action phase. In this phase, the player that has initiative will be the first player to go, and will choose one of his survivors that has not been activated this round yet, and he will go ahead and activate them. Each survivor can only be activated once per turn, and if a model is already engaged in melee combat, either with an enemy or a walker, before it has a chance to act, then you cannot activate it during this phase. Once you choose a model to be activated, the, the first thing you must do is check the model's nerve level and compare it to the threat tracker. If, it is, if the threat tracker is higher than that player's nerve level, then they must take a panic check. So let's go ahead and say that our player that has initiative 
is going to go ahead and activate Carl, who has a nerve of medium. And our threat track right now is at the all quiet. But if it happened to be on the high threat, then Carl would have to take a panic test, which when a, a survivor is required to take a panic test, they're going to go ahead and roll the yellow dice and consult the chart that you guys see here and resolve the effects of the chart. So whatever symbol you roll on the dice is what you will have to resolve before you take any of your actions. From here, then we're going to move on to actions. So unless the model is engaged in melee or is panicking when activated, the survival model may perform up to two actions in any order, but there are a couple restrictions to this. First, you may not perform the same action twice, and if any rule requires a character to perform a specific action, then the action will count as one of the two actions for the turn unless specified otherwise. If a survivor happens to be in the prone position, and they cannot choose to perform any actions except for the move action, but that is even limited to either the sneak or the stand up actions, which we're going to take a closer look at each one of those in a minute. Other than that, the actions that a survivor can choose from are to move, shoot, search, hide, stand up, hold your nerve, swipe item, make noise, or a special action, which we're going to go ahead and take a look at each one of those in more depth. So the first action we're going to look at is a move action, which when you perform a move action, you must choose whether you're going to sneak, which is a 4-inch move, or to run, which is an 8-inch move. But if you choose to run, it will create noise. So as soon as you're done with the action, then you would resolve the effects of noise. So from here, once you choose the length of movement that you want to do, you would place the ruler in base contact with the survivor that you're moving, and you move it along that track in any direction that you choose. And you can even change directions, so you could spend 2.2 inches of movement and then move and change the directions of it. You just cannot exceed the movement value that you've selected. The other thing is, is that you cannot move through other friendly models or enemies. And you must always keep at least one inch away from enemies and your model, unless you wish to engage them in close combat, in which case, when you move into base contact with them, then your activation will end, and you are not allowed to perform any other actions, if you had any others to perform. Now, during the model's movement, they can also move past barricades and cars. They just cannot do it during the long ends of either one of those obstacles. In order to move past it, the first thing they need to do is make sure that they have enough movement to make it past the particular obstacle. So Carl here is going to go ahead and check, and he's going to do a sneak action so he can move up to four inches so he can clear the barricade. So in order to, to clear it, the first thing he needs to do is perform a climb test. In order to do that, he will roll the black action dice. If he rolls a shield, then he successfully made it past the barricade and can move on the other side. If he rolls a blank, then he has failed and must end his move on the back side of the barricade. Now, a model can never end their movement on top of a barricade. It must go past it or behind it. And if a model has the runner special ability, then they will always auto-pass their test and will not need to roll the dice. Now, the one other thing to note about the barricades, cars, and supply counters, as you guys can see on this chart on the side, each one of them has some special rules along with it. The next action we're going to look at is a search action. In order to search, a survivor must be in base-to-base -base contact with a supply token and not engaged with an enemy model. The supply token itself can also not be in base-to-base -base contact with an enemy model. Once those requirements are met, then a, a survivor will draw the top card from the supply deck. If it's an item, then he can add it to one of his open slots or to his backpack. He can also choose to drop any item that he wants to make room for this item. If the supply card is an uh, a, uh, effect, then he must apply the effects of that card, such as finding a walker. From here, then he's going to go ahead and add the supply token to his card. If at any point in the game he chooses to drop the supply token or is killed, the supply token will be removed or returned to the field with the search side up. As supply tokens are an objective, a survivor can spend an action to pick a supply token up, but he is not allowed to search a already searched supply token to gain another item. Another action that a survivor can perform is a hide action. In order to perform a hide action, 
a survivor must be in base-to-base -base contact with a piece of scenery, and he must not have any enemies in his kill zone. So you'll place the kill zone token over the model that wishes to hide. There are no enemies in it. He can go ahead and hide. When he hides, he will place his model prone, which will, in some, with some scenery pieces, will provide him cover or block line of sight completely from his model. A prone survivor can choose to stand up as one of its actions, so you would just place its model back on its feet, and then if it had any other actions, it can perform those normally after that. A survivor model can also choose to hold its nerve. If it does, then it's going to go ahead and roll the black action dice. If it rolls the shield symbol, then it can reduce the threat track by one point. If it's a panicking model, it cannot choose to attempt this action. And if the character is a tactician, then it's going to be able to automatically reduce the threat by one, and it does not need to roll the black action dice. A survivor model can also choose to swipe items, which will allow him to rearrange any items in his inventory and his backpack, or it can choose to exchange items or trade items with any survivor that is in its kill zone. A survivor can also choose to make noise as one of his actions, so you would simply just resolve the effects of the noise after performing the action. And the last action that a survivor can perform is a special action, which some of the rules on survivor's cards or equipment will list that they must perform a special action to use that item or ability. With a shot action, a survivor must have a ranged weapon equipped. If it has multiple ranged weapons equipped, it can only use one for a single shot action. And it must have both line of sight to its targets and range. So in order to determine line of sight, we're going to go ahead and use Derek here. And as you can see on his pistol, he has a range of 10. You will draw a straight line from the center of his base to the center of the base of the model that he wishes to target. If that line crosses any other model, both friend and enemy, then the shot is considered blocked. If it crosses any barricade or car, then the model that it's targeting on the other side will receive cover and will receive cover for each obstacle that it crosses. The only exception to this is if he is in base contact with the obstacle that he's shooting over. In that case, then the model will not receive the bonus. So we're going to go ahead and use Derek, and his gun, as you guys can see, has a range of 10 inches, which is the full length of the ruler. So we'll line up the ruler with the edge of his base and see who we can shoot. So we have range to both of those zombies. And if we draw a straight line, it does not cross any other thing, so we have line of sight. Once we've determined that, then we're going to go ahead and gather his dice pool. So we check his weapon, which gives him two red dice. And we also check his shot skill, which will give him one white dice. And he's going to go ahead and shoot this zombie over here. So on the zombie's defense, it gives him one red dice. And he doesn't get any other dice because he's not behind cover. If it's an enemy survivor, if they have any other bonus equipment or anything that gives them defense, then they will also receive that. Now we're ready to go ahead and roll the dice. So first, Derek's going to roll his attack dice. And he rolls four hits and one critical. Then the zombie's going to roll its defense, and it rolls a blank. So then we're going to resolve. For each successful hit that Derek does, which is the, the splatter mark, it's going to cancel out one of the zombie's splatter marks, which the zombie didn't roll any. So each one of these counts as a wound. Zombies only have one hit point, so the zombie would be killed. If, it only had, if he only had rolled hits, then the zombie would be laid flat and has a chance to get up later on, as you guys will see. If it's an enemy survivor, then you will count up the number of hits that you get versus the number of defensive rolls that the survivor had, and the difference will be the number of wounds that that survivor will take. If a survivor takes enough damage to kill him, then he will, his figure or his model will be removed and you will place a walker in its place, as well as all his items will be removed from the game, and you will also place a supply counter where he died. Now, the one other thing we're going to go over are the criticals, which are the explanation points on the dice. If an attack has any critical hits with it, if it's against the walker, then the walker will be removed from the game instead of being lane prone, as this is considered a headshot. 
If it's against an enemy survivor, then each pro or each critical hit result will add plus one damage to that survivor. Now, the one other thing with this is anytime a weapon rolls a critical, you also must roll the black action dice to see if the weapon has run out of ammo. If you roll a shield, all is well. And if you roll a blank, then that weapon has run out of ammo and you would turn it face down to represent that it's down to ammo. So since Derek has rolled a critical and has done enough damage to kill the zombie, which the zombie only has one hit point, as I said, then it will be removed from the board and he will roll the black dice to see if his weapon is out of ammo. So he rolled a shield, so his weapon is okay. Now there's a couple other situations in shooting that I'd like to take a look at. The first is to shooting into melee combat. So we're going to go ahead and say that Sandra here is in melee combat with a walker and Derek wishes to help out. So first you would do all your regular things by checking range and line of sights, which he has range and line of sight, so he's going to say he's targeting this walker here. From here you're going to roll the black action dice. If you roll a shield, then, you've, then you're going to hit the target that you wish. If you roll a blank, then your opponent will choose one of the other combatants that's in that combat to target, so he could choose Sandra. Once you resolve who's getting hit, then you would conduct the shot as normal. The one other situation is that some of the weapons will allow you to fire multiple shots or skills. You can opt to fire fewer shots unless the weapon specifically forbids it. Each shot is going to be resolved separately, so you can choose a separate target if you wish. And as a single action, the noise or mayhem is only calculated once regardless of how many times you shoot in that single action. Once your activated survivor has performed his two actions or does not wish to perform any other actions this round, then he will mark his survivor as activated and it will pass to your the next player. In this way, players will go back and forth activating one survivor each until all the survivors have been activated. After all the survivors on both sides have been activated, now we're ready to move into the event phase which there are two separate steps in the event phase. The first one is the kill zone. So at this point, we're gonna go ahead and take the kill zone template and place it over each one of the zombies that is standing up and is not engaged in close combat. If there are any survivors underneath that kill zone even partially covering their base, then the zombie will move in a straight line and engage that survivor in close combat if they're able to come in contact with their base. So each zombie that has no survivors will not move at this time. So over here we have this zombie and he is partially covering Rick's base so he will move in a straight line and come in contact with Rick. All of our other zombies are not anywhere near survivors. So at that point we're ready to move into step two which is to draw the top event card and resolve its effects. So starting at the very top some of the event cards will add threats to our threat track, which we'll do immediately before we check the level. So we'll move it up to two, and we're still in the all quiet section, so we'll read that section of the event card. So it says that all walkers suddenly stop and nothing happens. Now, if we would have happened to be in one of the higher levels, so say if we were in the low level, we would have read the low level threat instead, which each player moves one eligible walker forward near towards the nearest survivor. So that will bring us to our next little section, which is to move walkers. When moving walkers, you can only move eligible walkers, which are walkers that are not prone and walkers that are not already in base-to-base -base contact with other survivors. When moving a walker, you're going to move them in a straight line, at six inches at a shamble, which is marked on the back of the ruler. When a walker moves into base contact with a piece of scenery, then it will stop its movement. If it's already in base contact with a piece of scenery, then it will move by the shortest path around that scenery towards its target. Walkers will never engage other walkers and will simply just pass through them. They will also pass through supply tokens. They will not be stopped by those. The only exception to this is if a walker moves onto the top of a walker's base, then it will not be able to do that. The one other thing with that though is if a walker moves into base contact with a survivor it will engage them. If a walker is in the way of that and there's nothing blocking that walker from moving over then you would simply just shift the walker over to make way for the new walker to come into contact with that survivor.
If you need to have a number of zombies enter play, then you would gather up a number of spare zombies that you have. If you don't have enough, then you would gather the ones that you do have and then increase the threat track by one point. From here, then you can place any of the zombies on any of the table edges as long as they are not within the kill zone of a survivor. And the player that has the initiative token will place the first zombie and that zombie is considered to have moved and then play will alternate back and forth between the players placing the zombies where they want. Again, as long as they're not within the kill, the kill zone of a survivor. So now that we have finished the event phase, we're going to move into the third phase of the round, which is the melee phase. And you guys are going to have to bear with me with this because this is a complex phase with a lot of different rule sets. So we're just going to work our way down through each one of those. So as you guys can see in this chart, there's a very specific way that you're going to break down the stage. The first is if any models are in melee combat, so here we have an example with Rick going against the walker, so that will meet that criteria, so we're going to advance our threat tracker by one point. When there are several models from both sides in a combat, the players must split the combat. So there is a number of rules that are going to govern this. So we're going to set this stage up first real quick. So we have Rick down here with a walker, and we're going to go ahead and move in one of these other survivors up here from the other group to show you how this works. So we'll say that uh, we have... Liam here facing Rick here and we're gonna go ahead and just throw another walker in there and make this really easy so we have models from both sides the walkers do not count in this when determining models from both sides the walkers are a separate source and will not count for this from here if a survivor is eligible to fight multiple enemies the owning player must choose which to fight and if a walker is eligible to fight multiple enemies, the player with initiative will choose which survivor the walker fights. Uh, from here, then we're going to nudge the models apart to separate them slightly so that you can see and resolve each combat individually. Now, the one other rule that cannot be negated is that all the models that are in the combat have to fight. You cannot split them so that only that one model is outside of combat. So for example in this situation since the zombies are both touching Liam then you could say that you could split off and do that where they are fighting one but Rick is all alone so in that situation you are not allowed to do that. So the most effective way to do this is to simply just separate them like this and have each survivor fending off one of the walkers. From here, then, we're going to establish the combat order. So the melee is resolved separately for each group of models in base contact. So from here, the player that has initiative will choose which combat to resolve in which order. So we're going to go ahead and resolve this combat here first with Rick versus the Walker. So as you guys can see in this chart, there's a specific way to resolve each combat, and each combat is going to be handled separately. So the first thing is to resolve handgun attacks. So if a survivor has a handgun and wishes to use it in, in uh, melee combat, then they will announce this beforehand. And if multiple models have the handgun from the different sides, then the player that has the initiative will choose to use his side first. From here, then you would resolve the handgun shot as a normal ranged attack. The only exception to this is that you will not roll the black action dice to randomize the shot. It will always hit the target that you choose. If the target you choose is killed or laid prone, then you are considered to be disengaged from the melee combat. This also means that if for some reason that model stands up, then you would become re-engaged in that melee combat. From here, if a model that is fired is still engaged after the shot, it may only choose to defend in the following melee. And if there are multiple models in the, from the same side that wish to attack rather than to defend, the shooting model contributes no dice to that combat. Now on top of this, gunfire may cause mayhem, and any mo walkers attracted to the fray do take part in the melee to, as the melee continues. So this, again, may end up causing combats to be split a second time after the initial split. Now we're going to move into resolving melee. So again, we're still looking at this combat with Rick versus the walker. 
So before making the melee attack roll, a player must choose whether the models on their side will attack or defend. The player that has initiative will always choose first. If both players opt to defend, then there are no blows that are struck. If several models on the same side are involved, they must all choose to attack or defend. They cannot split their dice. Walkers cannot choose to defend, and as long as a model has dice shown under its melee value on its card, then it can choose to attack, or it can choose to use a melee weapon. Otherwise, it can only choose to defend. Another thing to note is that survivors can only attack once per melee phase. So if they are, are forced to fight again for any reason, then they will only defend. So let's go ahead and create our dice pool now. So for our combat here, we have one walker, so he will receive one red melee dice. And with Rick, he does have a hatchet, which is a melee weapon. So for the, for the hatchet, normally you can only use one melee weapon, but under its attributes, it does say that you can dual wield it. So if he had another melee weapon, he could use that. And it's going to add one white dice to his attack roll. On top of that, he's going to get one white dice for his melee skill as well. From here, you would add up any other bonuses, and if a survivor is choosing to defend, you would add his defense instead of the melee dice, and any other bonuses from armor or equipment. From here, then the models are going to roll their dice, so we're going to go ahead and roll them together since the walker has different color than, than Rick does. So the walker rolls two successful hits and a critical, and Rick rolls two successful hits. Now the side with the highest roll is the winner, and if a combat is a draw, then the winner must still be determined for the purposes of the pushback, which we're going to cover in a couple minutes. So it's going to go in a certain order, so survivors are always going to beat walkers in a tie, and then survivors that have the initiative will always beat other survivors if they are tied. So now that we've determined that Rick is the winning model, we're going to go ahead and move the walker one inch away, as this is the pushback effect. So a model is going to be moved directly one inch away from Rick. When a model is pushed, it cannot be pushed into another melee combat. And if a, pot, a model is in proximity of other models and cannot be pushed back, then the winner is going to be pushed back instead. So in this example here, if we were turned in this direction, the zombie would not be able to be pushed back to enter this combat, so in this situation, Rick would be pushed one inch away from the zombie. From here, then, we're going to go ahead and resolve damage. So the difference in the, the successes that were rolled will be the number of, of uh, hit points that are lost. If the defending model wins the melee, then no damage is done, and it merely pushes back the other model as it fends them off. So the last part of melee combat is resolving damage. So you're going to determine the difference in successes from the total of one model to the other from both sides. So with our example here, we've both rolled two successes, so there is no damage done to either side. From here, you would resolve any criticals. So with the walker, since it rolled a critical, if it would have done damage to Rick, then he would have become bitten and flipped over his health token to the bitten side, and there would be additional effects to that later in the game. If Rick would have rolled a critical and done damage to the zombie, then he could have knocked the zombie prone. If he would have done this to another survivor, then you could potentially do additional damage, or it also depends on the weapon that you're using. Some weapons will have special effects. Now, if a model is defending and has more successes, then it simply fends off the attacking model and does not do any damage to them. And the last thing is if a walker is knocked prone during combat, it must be moved with its base one inch away if possible. Now there's a couple of things I'd like to cover real quick about melee combat. So the first is that if a single combatant is fight fighting multiple opponents and he wins the combat, he may decide or he can choose to divide the total damage caused between all the, any of the enemies that he wants or he can target and spend all of the damage on one enemy. Headshots in melee work exactly the same way as they do for shooting. The only exception to this is if you roll multiple headshots, then you can only allocate one to each enemy model in that combat. Now the one other thing I want to look at are with walkers, if there are multiple walkers in a combat against a single survivor, they're going to get an outnumbering bonus. So let's go ahead and go back to our example earlier. 
with Rick Fighten, our walker, let's go ahead and say that there was also two additional walkers that were in contact with Rick. So just like in normal combat, you would gather up your dice so Rick would get his two white dice, and then the walkers are going to benefit, as you can see on this chart here, the first walker is going to receive one red dice, the second walker would receive two red dice, and the third walker would receive three red dice. And this would continue all the way up to five walkers. So as you can see, this is not a good situation for Rick. So the walkers are going to go ahead and roll their dice and see what they get. And Rick will go ahead and roll his dice. So Rick went ahead and rolled two hits, but the walkers rolled six, plus their critical. So when resolving this, Rick would be pushed back if he's able to, which at this point he couldn't be pushed this way as there's uh, another combat there and he can't be pushed that way. So the walkers are going to be pushed back one inch away from him. And then we would resolve damage. So Rick cancels out two of the hits, but he's going to take four hits and he is bitten. So he'll flip over his health gauge and take four hits. So he's down to two hits remaining. Now the one other type of combat I'd like to cover is a multiple melee combat. So that means that there will be survivors from both sides plus walkers in that combat. So let's go ahead and take a look at that first. So we're gonna go ahead and move this walker away and we're gonna go ahead and say that uh, we have this situation where the survivors from both the groups are in combat with a walker. In this situation, the walkers will not be rolling dice separately, but will add their dice to, their, to one of the survivor's sides. The walkers will not gain an outnumbering bonus in this situation, so each walker will only add one red dice to that combat. And then the walkers that are in base contact with survivors from just one side, their attack dice are going to be added to the opponent's rolling side. When both sides are in contact, in the, which is in this situation here, then the player with initiative will choose which side the walker's attacks will be added to. And the walker can never fight on both sides. The side that, that benefits from the walker's attack dice cannot choose to defend, and if for any reason any of them must defend, then the walker will attack as normal and the defending survivors will not roll any dice. So let's go ahead and take a look at, at a couple examples of this. So in this situation here, with the walker being able to choose either side, the survivor that has initiative, which is Rick, will choose which side the walker will go on. So in this situation, Rick would get his two white dice, plus the walker's attack dice, as he's going to send the walker against Liam. And then Liam will have to decide whether he's going to attack or defend. So either way, he's getting a red dice, so he's going to go ahead and try to attack. And then you would resolve the combat as normal. Now the other situation that you might face is where you have a walker only touching one side. In this situation, Rick would choose which target he's going to go after, and from there he would get his dice as normal. When Liam does his, though, he gets to attack, and he will get two red dice, one for himself and one for the walker. And then the, the combat would resolve just like any other combat as usual. Another situation you may find yourself in is dealing with prone combatants. As we can see here in our example, we have Rick in contact with a walker. So if an attacker is not engaged in melee with any standing opponents, it may instead make a melee attack against a prone model in base contact. The prone model can only choose to defend, and if the attacker wins, the prone model is removed from play. If the prone model survives a melee, the attacker is going to be pushed back instead. And the one other thing to keep in mind is during a, an attacker's or a model's activation, if it is in contact with a prone model, it is not held in that combat and can move away as normal by simply disengaging and moving away. So once we've resolved all the different melee combats that we have to take care of, we're ready to move into the fourth and final phase in the round, which is the end phase. So during this phase, we're going to find out if any of the prone walkers stand back up and if any of our, our survivors have been bitten, if they have any ill effects from that. So the player with initiative, the first thing they're going to do is roll the black action dice for each prone walker. If they roll the shield, then that walker will stand up. If they roll a blank, then that walker will stay prone. 
So for each survivor that has been bitten and their health token turns to the bitten side, they must roll the black action dice. If they roll the shield icon, then there is no effect for this turn. But if they roll a blank, then they will take one wound. If this is the wound that will kill them, then their, their uh, survivor model is removed and a prone walker is placed in, in their space instead. Any equipment that they have is removed from the game. And if they had any supply counters, those will be placed back on the space next to them. If there are any special rules in play that require checks or if there are any effects from them, then we're going to go ahead and resolve those now. If there are several of these in play, players will take uh, it in turns and resolve them beginning with the player that has initiative. And then the last thing in the end phase is to move the initiative from the player that currently has it to the opposing player. The one other thing you guys are going to want to do is remove the activation tokens from each of the survivors at the end of the rounds before you start the new round.